recording. I'll show my screen. Okay. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes, okay. Yeah. So I um, want to welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season six and we are at episode uh, nine. Uh, if you would like to uh, look at our schedule for the entire season, uh, you can use the link there or you can use the QR code to the right. Um, for the month of March, well, today we'll, um, of course, be listening to Professor Keelan <laughs> on carbon dioxide and climate change. Next week, we'll look um, at environmental solutions using biomimicry chemical principles, and that will be presented by Mark Dorfman. Um, then <clears throat> on the 22nd, uh, Shada uh, Mahabir, um, based in Trinidad, will be talking to us about environmental innovation and entrepreneurship in the Caribbean. Then we will end the month of March in Atlanta, where we will hear about urban gardening and soil contamination. So that's our March uh, schedule. Uh, today, uh, my guest, my co-host is Christopher Ratan Singh. You'll be hearing a lot more from him um, here soon. Uh, he is the chairperson, the chairman of the Wildlife and Environmental Protection of Trinidad and Tobago, and also the chairman of the Council of Presidents of the Envi Environment, um, often referred to as COPE. So, Christopher, apart from what you have written in your bio about being an environmental conservationist and so on, what is something interesting about you, passion, something you're passionate about that you could tell us in a sentence? Hmm, that's a good one. <laughs> I think in a sentence, uh, one of the things I'm most passionate about would be uh, educating people about the importance because I, I, I would say for me, you might say education is not a, something quite as passionate, but I think most people here may disagree. Um, but I am quite passionate about educating people about wildlife, especially um, and wildlife, human wildlife conflicts and the importance of wildlife in our ecosystems. So I, I would say that's what I would be passionate about. Well, per perhaps then in season seven, <laughs> we could have you as our main speaker to tell us all about some of the things that you do with both uh, organizations. I can, so, yeah. I, I know you've asked me a few times now and I have been kind of dodging it. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm more than open to it, yeah. Well, one of the things you'll probably get to know about me is I'm persistent. <laughs> <laughs> well, no worries. Well, season seven it is. Then. As a scientist, we have to be. We can't just take no for an answer the first experiment results. No, no, no. Anyway, thank you for um, accepting to be co-host for us today, and we'll hear from you some more uh, pretty soon. So next person is Marcy Hamilton to give us a special feature presentation. Marcy, I think we've known each other for at least five years, like, you know, talking, collaborating, but I think we know each other <laughs> know off each other for a longer time or something. I can't remember for sure. I remember the Ox Creek project is one that you've been very much involved with. And we've actually had you on here as a main speaker before. And so we want to um, hear from you, give us some updates on what's going on here in Southwest Michigan. Great. 
Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple slides if I can share. Yep, I um, will stop sharing mine. See if we can do this. Mm -hmm. Can you? Can you see that? Yes, it's full screen. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, there's quite a bit going on in Southwest Michigan um, related to climate change and the challenges that we're facing with, uh, with Lake Michigan levels um, being, you know, pretty large swings from low to high and uh, short amount of periods has really caused a lot of issues along with the extreme weather events that we're seeing more of um, here in Southwest Michigan and how that's impacting our coastal communities. So uh, my agency, the Southwest Michigan Planning Commission, we cover three counties in Southwest Michigan, Bering, Cass, and Van Buren. And so two of those counties, Bering and Van Buren have communities along the Lake, uh, Lake Michigan. And so they're dealing with a lot of challenges with this. And so we're here as a resource for those communities and trying to help them uh, implement projects, planning, do better planning for um, resiliency and how we deal with this changing uh, climate in the future in terms of land use and how we build things or how we don't build things uh, to do a better job. And so a couple just real quick, couple projects. We, we do a lot here. We're a small staff here, about nine people located in Benton Harbor, uh, Michigan, but um, we do transportation, economic development, uh, community planning, uh, recreation planning, and I do a lot of the environmental work and water quality stuff. So um, just to highlight a couple of things that we're working with, some shoreline communities in Bridgman, um, they've actually set up a shoreline resiliency committee and are working on trying to educate the community about shoreline issues and the challenges. Um, right now, they're in the middle of reviewing their zoning ordinance. So looking at um, how they can be better when uh, they're building new homes or commercial areas to make sure they're set back off of Lake Michigan so that when we see erosion and high levels, they're not falling into the lake anymore and keeping trying to keep those shorelines more natural instead of hardening them and causing all kinds of problems. They're also looking at stormwater. Um, this is their committee, um, like I said, really focused on education and looking at policies in the community of how they can um, be a better steward of the coast and of Lake Michigan and the, of their water resources. Um, this is a project that they're doing where they're looking at how water flows through their community and where there's an opportunity maybe to do some green infrastructure or stormwater management using natural solutions. So understanding where water is going, it can help them identify appropriate areas for doing those types of things. So that's part of their um, policies that they're looking at. And when developers come in with projects, working with them to not put structures or development where um, water is gonna be an issue to try to um, be more proactive about what they're doing in terms of how they're building out their community. So they're taking a pretty proactive approach, which is really needed in these times. Um, here in Benton Harbor, like uh, Dr. Murray said, I've been on and talked a lot about Ox Creek. This is Benton Harbor. Um, shows, you know, here's Lake Michigan. This is the city's water treatment plant and their beautiful Jean Clock Park. Um, this is Ox Creek, which is a tributary to the Paw Paw River. And then this is the mighty St. Joe River um, that is flowing into Lake Michigan. So the city has spent, uh, has made Ox Creek a priority um, for revitalization or restoration. And also, um, there's a new kind of interest in looking at the St. Joseph Riverfront area here, Riverview Drive, because this experiences a lot of flooding issues with high lake, um, when the Lake Michigan rises, it backs up and causes high water in this whole area and flooding of roads and uh, parking lots and businesses. And so making sure we're trying to find solutions for that. Um, along this Riverview Drive area. Again, trying to use nature-based solutions more, trying to 
use uh, native plants and natural hydrology to try to um, curb some of these issues. So again, using these things will have co-benefits of greening up the area, making it look nicer, and also um, dealing with the flooding issues that they're seeing. So we've just kicked off a project this week that we'll be looking at that Riverview Drive area, trying to come up with a concept plan. Um, this is kind of an older plan that was done for the harbor, the Twin Cities Harbor and the St. Joe River. So we're gonna be re-looking at this area with a, a focus on coastal resiliency and how we can address stormwater in a better way so that we can, um, so the city can redevelop this area in a way that um, brings tax, much needed tax base back to the community and, and builds it. So that's an exciting project. Um, and just to recap on the Ox Creek project, um, you know, Ox Creek has a lot of challenges. There's legacy contamination from plating and other industries that were here. Um, there's a lot of impervious surface out in um, along I-94 that's causing a lot of flashiness and um, with the extreme weather events we're seeing, it's causing a lot of erosion and just kind of wiping out habitat in this little creek that goes right through the middle of Ben Harbor. Um, there's been a lot of illegal dumping that needs to be cleaned up. And then just the creek in the corridor itself needs a lot of attention to deal with invasive species and uh, restoration from all of the degradation it's seen over the years. So we've been, um, since summer of 21, been working with the city on planning and writing grants. And we've been successful in installing several rain gardens. One is at the Meyer. Um, one is at uh, Whiteman, which is a local consulting firm. We put one there. Um, we're starting now to work with Home Depot, Walmart, and Hall Park in the city to put in additional rain gardens. This is a picture of Hall Park. Um, beautiful. It's the city's oldest and largest park. It's gorgeous, um, right along Ox Creek. We're going to not only create parking along this road here, but then all the stormwater that comes down Highland Avenue, we're going to capture in these bioswales, which will end up in a, a rain garden wetland area before it reaches the creek. So it'll be filtered and slowed down and, and help deal with the, the flooding that we're seeing in Ox Creek downstream. So that's online to happen either later this year or next year. Um, like I said, we've been super busy writing grants. This is all the grants for Ox Creek that we've been able to um, apply for. Uh, most of them have been awarded, except for a couple here at the bottom are pending. Um, then we've also, like I said, start kicked off the Harbor uh, Riverview Drive project with a grant from our state Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Eagle. And we have a large grant pending with NOAA right now that would fund both implementation in Ox Creek and Riverview Drive. So our fingers are crossed that that funding comes through. Um, Benton Harbor is in a really great place right now with all of the Justice 40 initiative going, money going to these disadvantaged communities like Benton Harbor, and not requiring match. Before, you know, Benton Harbor had a hard time applying for grants because of the local match requirements. Now for Justice 40, that's not an issue as much anymore. And so we're being very successful and being very aggressive and proactive and trying to bring money here to help this community improve its water resources and address climate change. So that's just my quick update. And I will turn it over for the main program. Thank you for allowing me to, to give that. So like Marcy, do you sleep? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not this week. <laughs> oh my gosh. Does anybody have a question? I mean, this is really good stuff. I mean, the future, if all of these plans work out, Benton Harbor is going to look really beautiful. The park, yes. the, the creek. Yeah. Wow. Anybody has a question or comment from us before we move on to our mm -hmm. main event? Just one, just one comment, uh, Patricia McGraw from mm -hmm. Trinidad and Tobago. I mm -hmm. find this is very refreshing. I also find it's great the amount of finance and funding that you've managed to raise. I that, know. <laughs> um, that is very impressive. Yep. And tell me though, do you have 
town and country planning laws that kind of help or just are you planning officers? So we're a regional planning agency. We don't really have any authority over anything. We're a resource, a planning resource for the communities in our three counties. And so um, all of like the policies for land use planning is done at the city, village, township level. Um, so um, it's a patchwork of policies in, in Michigan and very complicated. But so the city, you know, is in charge of land use planning and they just completed their updated their new master plan and they're getting they're trying to get funding to update their zoning laws, which implements the master plan and kind of regulates how land is developed. And like I mentioned, Bridgman is right now reviewing their zoning ordinance with a coastal resiliency lens, trying to implement new policies that will protect the shoreline and manage stormwater better when new developments are built. So we're just a resource here trying to get the grants to help them to do that and the information and the resources to do to do better policies. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you so much again, Marcy. We will stay in touch and, you know, uh, look forward to more of your updates um, about what's going on in our community. So we will switch gears. And so now, Christopher, Hi. it's your turn to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks. Um, so first, I have to say thanks to you, Desmond, for the um, opportunity and the privilege to introduce uh, Professor Keeling, uh, because the more that I was able to be exposed to his work, the um, the more relieved I felt and the more uh, privileged I felt to, to be discussing this. So um, please allow me to introduce Professor Ralph Keeling. He's a professor of geochemistry at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, Professor Keeling has made some significant contributions to our understanding of carbon dioxide and climate change. Uh, his research spans into several key areas, including tracking global carbon flows and the study of atmospheric oxygen levels um, in relation to CO2 con concentrations. Uh, Professor Keeling's contributions, uh, I would say, have been pretty pivotal in this field of climate science. He's been offering a lot of deep insights into the complex dynamics of the carbon cycle and the urgent need for action and, and the need to address climate change. His work does underline the importance of continuous observation and the research to inform policy and conservation efforts aimed at mitigating the impact of human activities on the global climate. Professor Keeling has also made several contributions into the understanding of carbon dioxide and climate change and the broader environmental impacts of human activity. Now, while they have been quite detailed and technical in nature, they do provide a lot of essential insights into the mechanisms of climate change and the global carbon cycle. These contributions have also been uh, underscoring the complex interactions between human activities and the Earth's climate system. They often highlight a lot of the importance of the continuous research and the monitoring to inform climate change policies and climate policies and actions. Uh, Professor Keeling's work also continues to build on his father's child's legacy, uh, providing a lot of crucial data and insight that advance our understanding of climate change, and they're able to glide out the global efforts towards mitigating its impacts. So I hope, um, I know that's a, a small summary of uh, what you've been doing, but I hope it suffices. So welcome, Professor Keeling. Okay, th thank you, uh, Christopher, for the uh, uh, flattering, but also a thoroughly researched introduction. I, I, I almost think I want a script of that for my own purposes. <laughs> that was a masterful uh, summary that covered a lot of points. So that was uh, very impressive. And thank you. Thank you, Desmond, for uh, pulling us all together here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. I guess I don't quite know the audience, and and I hope I hope that we can uh, move fast enough so that we have time for discussion. I I've, I've prepared a talk that's uh, I aim to keep it pretty simple, so uh, we're not going to dive deep into uh, numbers or te uh, uh, technical matters, but there's some general points I want to get across, and so um, let me just start here. So yeah, so what do I do? I mean, uh, Christopher covered this a bit, but I. I'm involved in making atmospheric measurements of carbon dioxide and other gases. Um, this is a picture of me on an airborne campaign that's on an airplane. Most of the measurements I do are samples that are gathered from stations on the ground. And in addition, we have a continuous record. So I the, think you need to put 
um upload your oh, oh yeah yeah sorry yeah. i didn't share oh yeah sorry share, thank yeah. you desmond yeah, yeah for That's that not right. It's right here so here's i, I was yeah. only this far yet so here's my title slide and i was right here 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 i am on an airplane okay <laughs> thank you thank you um uh so yeah, so I said, so my, I run a lab, that's mainly what I do, that, uh, that, that tracks changes in the atmosphere composition of, of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2, and then other species like oxygen that are changing along with carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, as Christopher mentioned, I, I'm following in my father's footsteps, who was the person who pioneered the first uh, high uh, accuracy measurements of carbon dioxide showing that carbon dioxide was building up. Here, here he is uh, early in his career on a hiking trip. Um, how did he get into this business? Well, he, uh, he, he did a PhD in polymer chemistry in an era when the future was plastics. Okay. Well, you may remember that reference from a movie, um, yes. but he didn't want to work on plastics. And uh, he was uh, living and going to school in Illinois uh, and uh, had uh, fondness for the American West. So he was looking for an excuse to go West and work on something outdoors. And he went to uh, a postdoctoral position at the California Institute of Technology um, where people were working on lots of things and he had some freedom to pick projects. And the one that appealed to him was studying carbon in rivers. Why? Because it allowed him to go out and walk around in beautiful settings. <laughs> Smart guy. <laughs> but he quickly learned that the controls on carbon in rivers were uh, uh, not easy to figure out unless you knew what was going in the air above the river. So he developed methods for measuring atmospheric CO2, and that quickly became more interesting. Among the things he found was that uh, um, Carbon dioxide, uh, if you got away from a forest and you got away from a city, was actually pretty constant in the atmosphere. And that was in contrast to prior work uh, going back, gosh, 150 years or more, uh, measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that showed a lot of variability. And that's because people were looking at carbon dioxide outside their labs and cities, and they were seeing a lot of fluctuations. They were also using methods that were not precise enough to demonstrate consistency at the levels he could. Equipped with that knowledge that there was a stable background level of CO2, he was able to jump right into a cutting edge question, which is, is carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere? And he was motivated to start actually tracking carbon dioxide at these high uh, accuracy methods, using these high accuracy methods that he developed at a, at a newly opened observatory on, on the big island of Hawaii. This is a photograph of the Mauna Loa Observatory. It was established in the 1950s. Uh, this is looking over from the observatory to Mauna Kea, the other big volcano there. Um, and the, uh, with the help of the staff at the observatory, they put an analyzer out there and they started tracking atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in 1958. Um, now, uh, this was uh, not an easy thing to get going. These analyzers were complicated devices and they had problems. The station had a rocky start from the standpoint of getting power to it. It's pretty remote. You can see the power poles here, but they run miles down the lava flows uh, down to the, the city of, of Hilo down below. So this is what he found. For the first month in the March of 1958, they indeed got pretty constant levels. Well, this is blown up so you can see the little fluctuations, but everything is, all the numbers are between 316 and about 319 or so parts per million. So it, it conformed with the, the idea that the air, if you got away from a city or, or a forest, and how, how could you do better than be way up in a mountain in the middle of the Pacific? Indeed, uh, carbon dioxide levels were pretty constant. But then there was a power failure, and it took a while to get the power back on. When the power back came back on, carbon dioxide levels were now lower, and they were decreasing. He had no idea why this was happening, and he was very concerned that there was something wrong with his instrument. There was another power failure, and the carbon dioxide levels, when they, when they, they started uh, getting data again, were now even lower than before, but now there was the, the, the readings were drifting upwards. So he was not sure what was wrong and was trying to figure out how to fix whatever might be wrong. He, he, he was of the, of the view that the levels should be more constant than this. 
but they kept the instrument going. And about by this time of the second year, he could see what was happening is that it was drawing a regular seasonal cycle. So he had discovered that carbon dioxide wasn't just relatively constant and actually at the other uh, in that constancy was actually fluctuating up and down the season and it made a ton of sense because carbon dioxide is taken up by plants when they grow there's a growing season in the northern hemisphere where Mauna Loa is, is located uh where the forests as you know <laughs> uh take up and grow in the in the, in the spring and summer uh, and then the, the rest of the year, there's decomposition going on. So that would indeed impose a fluctuating level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And they were picking up. So he was seeing basically the planet breathing at this large scale. Um, and the measurements have been kept going. And this is what the record looks like now. Um, those first few years, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I was just showing you the data from right back down here, uh, up and up and up and up. This is from just uh, yesterday. I got this graph. Oh, okay. um, uh, and now we're up uh, poking, poking above 425 parts per million. We haven't had a monthly value. These black points are monthly averages. Um, and we haven't had a black point above 425, but we'll probably have it uh, this month actually. So mm -hmm. a, new, a new milestone, of course, when you're, it's like, it's like getting older. Um, every year is a new milestone because you're older every year. Um, and in fact, uh, I can uh, pretty much count my age by the number of wiggles in this curve because I was born back here in 1957. So, so this first hump here at the very beginning, I was one year old. Um, so I was born when carbon dioxide levels were around 315 parts per million. And everyone can put their 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 birth CO2 level in, in numerical form. You, you, you might want to figure out how what CO2 levels were when you were born. Okay, you can read it off this graph. Um, and, and sadly, but sadly, it just keeps going up. And that's, of course, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that comes up in conversation is how do you, how do we know that this is actually caused by humans? And I want to point out that that's actually a kind of silly question. <laughs> so I'm going to make an analogy. Uh, an analogy is a chicken coop. Okay, chicken, you put, you have, you have a chicken coop. And you on, 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 on a particular day, it's empty. And then you put 10 chickens in it. OK, so the 10 chickens in the coop. OK. But then you come back the next day and oops, there are only five chickens in the coop. So what question comes to mind? It's like, what happened to the five that aren't there? Right. You know, what happened to the other part? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. Do, do you ask the question, why are there more chicken chickens in the coop than there than, than they were when you started? No, you know why, because you put them there. <laughs> so the mystery is what happened to the ones that aren't there. It isn't so so it isn't so much a question of why is carbon dioxide building up. We know why it's building up because we're emitting so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it more than accounts for the rise in CO2. So already from the very early days of this, the science was focused on where is the carbon dioxide that's not in the atmosphere. It was never a question of why was it building up. It was obvious why it was building up because we know how much carbon dioxide we're adding to the atmosphere. We know how many chickens we put in the coop and we can see that some are missing. So we can see that less carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere than we added. So the focus was on where is the extra carbon dioxide going? How do we know how much carbon dioxide is going in the atmosphere? Because it's mainly coming in from fossil fuel burning and we are tracking reasonably well, we could do better, but reasonably well, how much carbon dioxide is being produced through the extraction and burning of fossil fuels. And this is an example of a coal mine in Wyoming, a very thick coal seam. And you can see, you can see all the, the, the mass being taken away. And that, that's mass that's, that's being turned into carbon dioxide and released into the atmosphere. So this is another version of the curve showing uh, a second curve, well, which is how fast carbon dioxide would be increasing if it all stayed in the atmosphere. Hmm. That's that black curve. And then the, then the actual curve is the, is the one I showed before. And you can see that indeed the actual curve is increasing about half as fast as you'd expect. So about half of the carbon dioxide we emit isn't staying in the air. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the question is, where is it going? Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's not the relevant question. The question is, where is the extra carbon dioxide going? So that's where the science is focused. And that's where the, the, my, my focus early in my career was. But um, we also have a broader perspective on this uh, through, uh, th this was not available when my father started, but there's been a reconstruction of prior carbon dioxide levels that was possible because we have old air trapped in Antarctic glacial ice in bubbles. You can extract the ice from the bubbles. You can figure out how old the bubbles were because you can figure out how deep they were in the ice and the ice sheet. So you can get a chronology of carbon dioxide level going back in the past. The record is not as detailed. The record is not as precise, but it's more than good enough to, come to, to line up with the, the, the Mauna Loa and other measurements at other sites that we have and produce effectively a global record going back. This is showing that we can see that from about 1700 to about 1800, carbon dioxide level was pretty constant. <clears throat> and then indeed it starts rising pretty much in concert with the industrial revolution um, and the, the, the beginning days of the extraction of fossil fuels uh, and continuing to rise, accelerating all the way to today. So the highest rates of emission of fossil fuels and the highest rates of growth are right now. Mm -hmm. And that's on top of the fact that the levels are as high as they've been for a long time. Um, and we can, of course, go further back with the ice. And you can see that levels were constant here all the way back to the birth of Christ um, and pretty much centered around 280 parts per million uh, for, 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 for thousands of years. Indeed, we can go back tens of thousands of years with the ice. And you can see the levels were constant for a very long time. This is the, going back to the dawn of civilization on mm -hmm. our planet, um, the, the first uh, cities in the Middle East and elsewhere were being uh, established around that time. Um, and you can see the different years going up there, up and up and up. Now, if you go even further back, carbon dioxide was not constant. And uh, the furthest we can go with ice cores is about at this point, and pe there are people trying to work to push it further back, and they'll probably succeed at some point. Anyway, you can go back 800,000 years and you can see the carbon dioxide indeed fluctuated. It was mostly fluctuated between levels that were lower than 280 parts per million um, and then back up to those. And, and these, are, these fluctuations are, are associated with the ice, the, 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 the waxing and the waning of the ice ages. And uh, the high levels correspond to so-called interglacials, like the Holocene. The last 10,000 years is a relatively warm period compared to the last millions, many millions of years. And then in colder periods, carbon dioxide was lower. It's not surprising that carbon dioxide would fluctuate naturally because after all, it's a reactive gas. Um, it's released into the atmosphere from the solid earth from volcanoes. It, it wafts around in the atmosphere, it dissolves in the ocean, carbon is removed from the ocean by, by sediment formation from shells or organic matter. So it's being added and removed from the, from the atmosphere ocean system. And it's also can be piled up in the deep ocean relative to the surface ocean where, and that can actually reflect atmospheric levels. Uh, it, it's not that <clears throat> relevant to worry about the details of why this went up and down, but clearly this was part of a natural cycle. And humans have been adding carbon dioxide on top of that at a rate that's way faster and way um, larger in magnitude than these fluctuations now. Um, we can't go further back with ice cores, but you can go further back with various so-called proxy methods. These are ways of establishing some estimate of what carbon dioxide level was by looking at isotopes of carbon in leaves or looking at the distribution of particular organic molecules in marine sediments or looking at boron isotopes in, in, in materials deposited from seawater. All of these give you some indication of past levels. These are way less precise than the ice core data, but they do paint a picture of carbon dioxide levels that really um, were scarcely as high as we are now, even if you go back millions of years. But if you go back tens of millions of years, there was a period in the, in the early, this is called the Cenozoic, this whole period here, the early Cenozoic, um, where levels were probably up to the 800 parts per million level. And there were some spikes in here that were probably were shot up higher. Some of these fluctuations are probably not noise. Um, 
anyway, to get to get levels as high as today, you probably have to go now. I mean, possibly in the in the, the Pleistocene optimum here, where there's uh, levels possibly as high as today, but we're pretty much pushing back now to to having to go back tens of million years to to find levels that are comparable today. So, um, uh, in in the end, we can expect that we're perturbing the Earth on on the magnitude of the kind of perturbations that we saw back here. We're not going back in the past. We're we're, we're changing things very rapidly. Um, so the past is not a good analogy for the future, but in some cases we can draw inferences from it and the magnitude of changes we're bringing about are of the same magnitude, which is massive. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about the controls. Where is the carbon dioxide going? Where is it coming from? So I mentioned fossil fuel burning as the dominant source. So this is an attempt to put together a budget for carbon dioxide that recognizes a few different terms. First of all, we know how fast atmospheric CO2 is building up. That's measured. That's what we're calling in this equation, the atmospheric growth rate. And this was this would be expressed in, in some units like tons of extra carbon in the atmosphere per year. So it's a rate. It would be the time derivative of this Mauna Loa record, how fast it went up from one year to the next. That increment can be explained by how much fossil fuel we added. Um, now, we recognize that there's an additional human source of carbon dioxide from land use. As land is cleared, particularly forested land is cleared for agriculture, the carbon that's in the trees or in the soils is decomposed or burnt and released into the atmosphere. And as, as land has been cleared over time, that's been a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It was probably bigger in the past than it is today, but it, it, it has been and continues to be a source. Um, it's of order of 10% of fossil fuel burning. So it's not that big, but it's big enough to be counted and, 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 and controlled. Uh, and then, so those are the sources. And then where, is the, where can the carbon dioxide be going? Well, it, it's going somewhere into the, the, the surface of the planet. Uh, and it could be going either into the ocean or it could be taken up by land plants that are growing faster for some reason. Now the ocean uptake um, is understood from a chemical standpoint quite well. Carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in water, forms an acid, carbonic acid, and that uh, <clears throat> forms ions and they react with these other ions and in seawater called carbonate ions. And so this is kind of an acidic form of carbon and carbonate is kind of a basic form of carbon. They'll tend to react together. Acid base uh, react with each other, and they're forming a neutral product called bicarbonate. You may you may know that baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, mm -hmm. so this is not uh, an exotic chemical. So we're basically the oceans can take up carbon dioxide because they have carbonate that that will react with the CO2 to form bicarbonate. And there's quite a lot of carbonate in the ocean. So there's a lot of capacity to neutralize excess carbon dioxide through this reaction. I should point out that this, this reaction has consequences for life in the ocean because there are organisms that grow their shells based on carbonate ions. Mm -hmm. And with less carbonate, because it's being used up by this reaction, it can be challenging for shells to grow. And so there's a direct consequence on the growth of some kinds of marine organisms. Um, so this, this reaction is going on here, uh, at least uh, we know it can, and the, the question is how fast. And the other thing that's possible is that the, the, the land can be taking up carbon dioxide. Also, after all, photosynthesis takes up CO2. Uh, but I'll point out that that's, okay, so this is a schematic of, 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 of what's going on in the ocean. Um, it turns out that the, the critical process in the ocean in addition to this, these chemical reactions, is how fast the waters mix. And that's because the, the, the surface layers of the ocean, say going back, going down maybe uh, 10 to 100 meters or so, let's say you know, 50 to a couple hundred feet deep, uh, those, those waters typically are churned by the winds and they're in good contact with the atmosphere. And you'll tend to have a rather rapid uh, uh, reaction with the, the carbonate in those waters, but the reaction then stops because it comes to a new equilibrium. And the only way you can get it to go further is to mix up water that hasn't been exposed to the extra CO2 from deeper down. So the rate at which the ocean takes up CO2 is very dependent on how fast the ocean circulation is going, particularly how fast 
deeper waters are intermixed with surface waters and, and back down around again. So that it's a deep overturning circulation that governs how much the ocean can take up. Uh, another way to put that is that most of the deep ocean is actually pretty isolated from the atmosphere. So even though there's carbonate down there that could be used to take up CO2, it's mostly not being exposed to the atmosphere unless it's mixed up by some process into this, these surface waters. And so what's controlling the uptake is how fast you're mixing deep waters up to the surface. And of course, if you're mixing deep waters up, you have to be mixing surface waters back down again. So it's an overturning. Um, but let's talk about the, the, the ability of the land to take up carbon dioxide. So I mentioned that uh, photosynthesis, of course, takes up CO2, um, but it's not some magic reaction where the, 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 the carbon just disappears. What's happening is that the plant is growing and the carbon that was as CO2 and was taken up is now still present in the system, but it's present as tissues of the plant themselves. So a, a, a plant or a forest can only take up carbon dioxide if there's growth. Of course, plants grow, so what's the problem? The problem is that in any ecosystem, any forest that's in any kind of reasonable state of maturity, you're gonna have not just plants growing, you're gonna have old plants or diseased plants that are dying and decomposing. So there's a cycle of life, and there's one part of the cycle of life takes up CO2, another part of the cycle of life releases CO2, and the full cycle of life is a do-nothing loop. We added CO2 to the system, we, we, or we, 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 we took up CO2, we, we gave it back again, this is the reverse arrow here showing, showing it going in the other direction. Um, and so in order for the ecosystem as a whole to absorb carbon, we have to have the cycle of life not balanced. We have to have an imbalance in the cycle of life um, because a mature forest will have both of these going on at the same time. So we do have indications that the land is taking up carbon dioxide. And what that means is that the cycle of life is going in the favor of more growth and over, over decomposition. So surprising as it may seem, there's pretty good evidence that the land, land ecosystems are absorbing carbon dioxide by, by some kind of perturbation to the cycle of life. This is not a simple uh, 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 problem as the oceans. The oceans, we understand the chemistry. It was that simple reaction I put down, but what's going on on land is more subtle. Something is causing plants growth to accelerate. And one of the main candidates for that is just carbon dioxide in the atmosphere itself. Carbon dioxide is, at least for many types of plants, well, it, it's, a, it's a necessary component for growth, but you give, give the plant more CO2 in the air, they'll many times often grow faster. So there's a CO2 fertilization that's probably driving a lot of this extra uptake, amplifying the, the, the growth over the decomposition so that we have a net uptake overall. So let's put this in magnitude. Um, uh, it's really important to think about how big these flows are and how big the reservoirs are because it informs what's essential and what's just uh, a, a smaller component of, of a solution that we might come up with. So this is trying to represent amounts of carbon. The units I'm using here are billions of tons of carbon. I, what I, the ton here is a metric ton, not too different than one of our tons. Um, and we're measuring tons of carbon. The, the community out there often talks about tons of CO2, and you'd have to multiply these numbers by 44 over 12 to do the unit conversion between the atomic weight or the uh, molecular weight of carbon dioxide versus, versus carbon itself. Okay, so 600 units in the atmosphere. Um, th there's a reasonable estimate of how much fossil fuel uh, is available. By the way, this is quite open-ended because it depends on technology and price and market and so forth. So it's not a firm number. Um, and you can see that there's more than enough carbon in fossil fuels to increase the atmospheric level several fold. After all, we, we went from 280 up to about 420 something. So it's gone up about 50%. Um, but it could go many times that if we go through all of all the fossil fuel reserves. Of course, it is, and, and okay, here's another estimate of uh, suggesting there could be even larger amounts of fossil fuel. Let's look at the oceans. The oceans are an important reservoir here. There's a lot of carbon in the ocean as, as bicarbonate uh, and, a, and a smaller amount is carbonate. So, and, and so the total amount of carbon is this 
circle here. The circle's so big, I couldn't fit it on the screen, but you can imagine how big it is. And here's our carbonate down here. So there's, there's quite a lot of carbonate available to neutralize this fossil fuel CO2. So that's an important, re important long-term uh, reaction for the system. But as, as I said, it's limited by how fast the ocean can bring this carbonate up into contact with the system. And here's the, here's the natural reservoirs. These are all the reservoirs that existed naturally, pre-industrially, okay, 600, 1500. And here's what's in plants and soils. The, the living parts of the land biosphere have about 400. There's more carbon uh, stored in soils, particularly, and in, in including permafrost soils, where there's a lot of carbon sort of kept in cold storage. Um, so this gives you a sense of magnitude. Now, what have we done to the system to perturb it so far? We basically, um, this is a few years old. I should have updated this, but this is these are probably numbers from about, oh, about two, 2022. So these are two years old. These numbers change every year. That's one problem with giving this talk is I have to keep updating my slides. Um, anyway, it gives you a feeling for two years ago. This is, this is how big a bite we've taken out of fossil fuels. So we've, we've gone through about a third of this estimate here of 1500. We've added that to the atmosphere. By itself, the atmosphere would have gone up quite a lot from, from almost four, 600 to almost 1100 with this. Of course it didn't. And then we also have been doing the land use emissions. That's about 200. Cumulatively, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, only about half or a third of fossil fuel burning, but today it's more like a 10th. I said it was a 10th, but that's because it started earlier and there was larger emissions in the early 20th and late 19th century. So this is looking at the, the total emission all the way from the pre-industrial revolution to today. This is, here's how much atmospheric CO2 built up. Um, we believe that about eight, uh, uh, 188 went into the ocean and about 200 went into the land. So you can get a feeling of magnitude here. So look, look at this. We go, through, we go through all this fossil fuel. Where is it going to go? Um, the plant, in order to take up all this extra carbon by growing plants, we'd have to increase the amount of plant matter in the world uh, many folds to do that. So th this is a question where magnitudes matter. So if you think you can grow your way out of this problem by growing trees, you're delusional. <laughs> you can help a little bit. So it's not that trees aren't important and it's not that trees don't matter for other reasons, but there's no silver bullet in growing plants unless you can somehow harvest the plant and store the carbon back in some deep reservoir and have another plant replace it and keep growing. In other words, build up another fossil fuel reservoir. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's immediately obvious from this is that there's a the limited capacity of the land biosphere to solve this problem for us. Um, and you can also see that even though there's a lot of carbonate in the ocean, it's not vastly more than the amount of fossil fuel. So we start eating into this reservoir. So the system starts, the ocean will lose capacity over time as, as the, um, we add more and more carbon to the system. Um, and people have talked about trying to keep the world below two degree C limit or 1.5 degree C limit. You can measure that in terms of how much extra carbon we could emit. And so this is about how much we could emit to stay under a two degrees global temperature rise limit. Um, and that would require leaving about a third of the fossil fuel in the ground, not even, not, not even ex ex extracting it. Unless we could somehow <clears throat> find some other process that would enhance these sinks. And there are of course people talking about how to do that. But much easier is just to find alternate energy sources that allow us to not need to burn this fossil fuel. Certainly that's likely to be an easier way to do this. Um, I point out that uh, uh, the uh, actions to reduce emissions from fossil fuels will have big co-benefits in terms of air quality. This is a picture of the city of Delhi. I got off the web and this mm -hmm. is before COVID and this is during COVID when they had lockdowns. And the difference is that you don't have these all this traffic out there emitting local pollution. And so suddenly you have good air quality. So this is the this is the, the, the benefit of electrification, for example, for urban air quality. So you can get rid of the fossil fuel burning within the cities, you have enormous improvement in the quality of life within the city. So there's a big co-benefit of getting off fossil fuels. 
Um, now, important thing about the fossil fuel pollution is that it's cumulative. That diagram I showed with the circles <clears throat> emphasized that or, or, or was built on that, but I want to make it another way. So let's suppose you, 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 you look out your bedroom window and this is what you see. Now, obviously, um, you, you're not living in a great place because you're living close to an admission of, of a power plant or something. Um, but if you turned off the power plant, suddenly you would have clear air, right? So the problem would go away as quick, quick as you turn off the tap, turn off the, the source. That's not how fossil fuel burning works. And that's because it's cumulative. This, the, the, the CO2 is building up. Um, it's a little bit like a landfill problem. So we're, we're disposing of our waste carbon into the atmosphere and it's building up. It's a bit like trash in a landfill. If you stop producing garbage, the landfill full of garbage doesn't go away. It's still there. The garbage heap is still around us. So the, 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 our past garbage from past emissions is still all around us. It's a cumulative problem. This slide puts the buildup of carbon dioxide in, in the perspective of some of the other greenhouse gases that are, that are also important to this problem. Um, and one way to measure the uh, potency of these gases for climate is through this metric called effective rate of forcing. I don't need to get into that here, but the, how big the bar is, is a measure of how much impact the emissions through 2019 have had uh, on this measure of how much we're changing climate. And carbon dioxide is this red bar on the top here. It's a little over two of these units. Um, there are other greenhouse gases. There's methane, there's nitrous oxide, and there are industrial gases like CFCs um, mm. that have halogen, halogens in them, so it's sort of hal halogenated uh, compounds. Um, so these are the main things driving warming. There's some dis additional contributions from ozone. Uh, this is the pollution that tra also traps infrared um, and other small contributions here. Turns out when you cut forests, you make the land less dark. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that actually causes cooling. So trees actually cause warming because they make the land surface more dark and absorbs more sunlight, kind of confusingly. Um, and then there's another contribution from the fact that all this uh, emission from fossil fuel burning and other kinds of burning is contributing to haze. You saw that in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And the haze actually causes cooling because it reflects sunlight back to space. So these are all the different contributions. But the biggie is carbon dioxide. It's, 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 it's the biggest thing on here. Um, and the problem is not going to be solved unless we tackle carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide problem is not going to be tackled unless we deal with fossil fuel burning. So um, that's the, the urgency here. So um, why am I showing this again? I've forgotten now. Um, yeah, I think that's out of order. Okay, so where you know what 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 is the climate change uh, CO two buildup? What is what does it look like? And I could have given a whole talk on that, but I just want to remind you that the stakes are high. Um, the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes warming, of course, by the greenhouse effect. Warming causes uh, more evaporation. It causes more precipitation. So we can expect more more uh, more flooding and more severe flooding. Um, more heat and drought. This is a photograph from nearby where I live, where there was a, a beautiful forest overlooking the ocean that died a few years ago because of beetles, but the beetles got in because the trees were drought stressed. Um, so we've been losing trees here, although we're gaining other trees. So, but the old ones are often dying off because they're no longer fit to live in the present climate. Um, wildfires, are a big problem out here in the West and other parts. And they're driven by, the, uh, to a large measure, by the increase in temperature and the increased drying capacity of the atmosphere associated with that creates more favorable uh, conditions for fires and particularly for, for, for fires to grow explosively. And we've seen a lot of that. And so it's one of the most serious consequences I think for a lot of people to date is the degradation of air quality associated with wildfires 
all driven by CO2 buildup in the atmosphere. So if you can't play outside because of there's if your kids can't play outside because of there's there's wildfire smoke for a lot of the year, it really impact, impacts your quality of life because um, it spreads so widely. Um, there are challenges out in the West associated with where we're going to get our drinking water, loss of snowpack. We get a lot of our water from snow that melts through the summer and trickles into our, our water distribution systems. But if the snow is all gone by July, how are we going to get our water in August and September? It's a big challenge that we have to face. And many parts of the world have similar challenges to us in just water supply. And this is, this is probably the hardest part of this is that if, if for people who live off the land themselves, in other words, they're more subsistence and growing, growing things to, to, to maintain themselves at a small scale, they really depend on a climate that allows them to live. And, and, and people like that are very vulnerable to, to being displaced because of climate change. And so the, the, the human cost of this problem looks like it's gonna be pretty pretty daunting. Um, it's almost the scariest part of this. Where are these people gonna go mm. who can't live on their land anymore because it's not fit for them? Mm. Um, I mentioned the impact of carbon dioxide on, on, on sea life, that's a, that's a serious concern. I also mentioned one other thing that's not usually talked about because it doesn't sound bad, um, and but it, it is has, has major consequences and that is that some, some, some Forests are probably growing faster, and other parts of the land biosphere is growing faster. So there are really three impacts of rising CO2. One is directly on climate through the greenhouse effect. The other is on marine life, and the other is on photosynthesis. So there are three chemical consequences of carbon dioxide. They're all probably important, um, and uh, they all have consequences. If you're changing a forest by having it take up more carbon, you are changing the forest. Mm -hmm. A forest can't take up CO2 and be the same forest. It's a different forest. <clears throat> so there's environmental consequences of rising CO2 on ecosystems. Um, so <clears throat> just a quick overview. How do we gain control of this problem? There's two categories of action. We can, we can reduce emissions, mitigate. Um, uh, you can reduce the impact of the emissions, uh, some kind of geoengineering where you might put haze, some people propose somehow offsetting the radiation perturbation from carbon dioxide by doing other things to the atmosphere, not something I'm very fond of, but it's, it's being discussed. Um, we could try to enhance the sinks for carbon um, by growing more trees, but of course, where are they all gonna go? Um, or enhancing the ability of the ocean to take up carbon dioxide. And the other category is adaptation or, or building resilience, just getting ready for the change. And, and it's clear that these changes are already upon us. We're living through it now. Um, so there's no question that we have to get on with this and, and just start do it, doing our best to, to, to plan ahead and, 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 uh, and cope with the problems that are coming. Um, both of these, I'll point out, require changes in infrastructure and they both of them require changes in behavior. We have to learn how to live well without burning as much fossil fuel. That's to me the big challenge. <clears throat> so a couple little final thoughts here. So what is this person doing? This person is punting, right? So I give this give this uh, uh, to high school students. Say, what is this person doing? Oh, they know he's punting. Okay. So why am I showing punting? What what does it mean to punt? Well, punting means that you give up for now and hope for a better chance later. Right, so you're kicking the ball down the field because you can't you can't take it forward at the moment, but you hope that you'll have another chance later. Um, can we punt on the climate problem? Can we say, oh, this we can't deal with it now. We're going to come back and deal with it later because we can't. No, there's no punting on the climate problem, and that's because it's in motion. It's going against us. The, the world is changing. Um, if if we're going to deal with that, there's no time like now. We can't we can't just say, okay, let's just wait and see if we can figure this out at some point in the future. It's on us. Um, so what are some of the solutions? Obviously, alternate energy. We could have better ways to move around. How do we live well with less fossil fuel? One is just to amplify the use of uh, alternate ways of moving. Most of the world is ahead of the U.S. in allowing people to move around in ways without cars, and we could, we could learn a lot from other countries. 
Um, and by the way, the, the, the co-benefit of this is that our, our young people could move around without their parents having to drive them. Um, so it could affect other things. Uh, turns out that uh, eating, eating healthy also can be better for the climate because there's a, there's a big energy cost and fossil fuel costs of meat and just reducing the amount of meat you eat can actually reduce your carbon footprint. So finally, <clears throat> Where, 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 where has a similar story been told before? This is kind of a, a massive change in our planet, a massive human action that's having long-term major consequences. And, and where, where, nothing, is, nothing is new, right? Everything has this precedent. So what's the precedent for this? Well, you have to go to the Bible, I think. This is the best I can come with, Adam and Eve. Okay, so they're living in the Garden of Eden um, it's a wonderful planet, wonderful place, but they have this forbidden fruit that they can't resist. Hmm. The forbidden fruit, fossil fuel. We can't hmm. resist fossil fuel. And by eating the forbidden fruit, they change their environment forever. They're cast into a new world, a new world of trouble. Hmm. So we are, we are Adam and Eve eating the apple. That's what we're doing. Wow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. I've never really heard that interpretation, but it's so, so like on point. Wow. Okay. Well, listen, listen, I'm happy to take questions. That was a very uh, singular path through this topic, and there's a lot to talk about, and I, I, could, have, I could say more, so... I hope I don't know I, don't, I did on time, but if there's time, oh, we we are good, we are good, we are good. Christopher, do you want to jump in here? Yeah. I have got a few questions to you, Professor Keeling, if you don't mind. Sure. So, um, you discuss some of the main sources of the rising CO two levels, uh, notably being fossil fuel, the land use changes, as well as uh, deforestation and everything like that. You highlighted that there have been some challenges in accurately measuring the magnitude of some of these sources in the past. Uh, so uh, what can you speak of some of the difficulties in researching and understanding the effects that you've been seeing so far, as well as the effects of climate change? Yeah, thanks. I mean, that actually touches on what my research involves, which I didn't get into very deeply here. So thanks for that opportunity. I mean, one of the problems that the community faced at the point I entered the field was sorting out, maybe the slide will help here. So uh, I'll go back here. Go back to oh, where was it? Maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, this this slide. Um, so I, I entered the field in the early '80s. Uh, that's when I first sort of became aware of this in its 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 dimensions like this. And at that point, what was well known was the atmospheric growth rate. That term was known because of my father's measurements of the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. We had a pretty good idea of fossil fuel emissions because it was being tracked as an industrial, uh, valuable industrial commodity. And the other terms there, the L, U, O, and B, were therefore, you could, you could solve that equation for their sum. So we knew the total amount that wasn't accounted for by the other two terms, but it wasn't really easy to sort out separately how much was going into the ocean versus how much was going into the land. And land use was also pretty uncertain at that point, the emissions from land use. Um, so what I started to do is I, I started a program to track changes in atmospheric oxygen along with carbon dioxide. And why does oxygen do something here? The reason is that this reaction of the, of the ocean taking up carbon dioxide <clears throat> doesn't involve oxygen. It's not photosynthesis. It's inorganic acid base chemistry. So to the extent this reaction is going on, there's no effect on oxygen. Whereas if plants are taking up CO2, they're doing it by photosynthesis. And so there would be an increase in oxygen. So the, the difference between these two, these processes were resolvable as separate 
impacts on the atmosphere if you could measure changes in atmospheric oxygen. Now, I should point out that the biggest effect on oxygen is burning fossil fuels, because that removes oxygen irreversibly from the atmosphere. Um, and, and so the guide, idea was you measure the change in oxygen, you correct for the known fossil fuel component, and the leftover oxygen balance would give you a handle on what the land was doing because the ocean wouldn't contribute to that. So, so my own work involved setting up a program, measuring changes in atmospheric oxygen, and showing indeed that there was a need for a land sink term like this right here. So my own work reinforced the impression that there needed to be a land sink. Other work has gone into that. As I mentioned, the main way the ocean takes up CO2 is with this reaction, but the reaction is limited by mixing. So a lot of work went into establishing how fast the ocean circulation is going. And those two perspectives are largely convergent on, on how this budget works out. So that gives us a handle on the ocean and B, ocean and land use terms here. Uh, I'm sorry, the ocean and the, the, the land uptake. And the land use term is, is, has remained kind of tricky um, so that's, uh, I would say there's still a factor of two uncertainty in this or so. Um, and that's because the land surface is very heterogeneous and what's going on in one place is not necessarily the same as what's going on in the other. You have satellites that are looking at it, but they don't exactly measure carbon. They just measure what you can see from space, but you can't see deep. Um, uh, so uh, the numbers have gotten better with time, but it, that, that's that's tricky. So we, there, there's still on, still some uncertainties in this. Um, we could do a better job of this, and we don't know exactly how these are trending because uh, we're concerned, of course, that if these sinks go away, the CO2 will build up even faster. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'd like to be able to track this with really high fidelity year to year, and there's still work to do that. So that was a very long answer. So. <laughs> it's okay, but it, it does give us uh, some insight. And I do have one more sort of twofold question. Um, and you'd have to forgive any inaccuracies here, and you can definitely correct me, um, especially on the timelines and stuff like that. So, uh, you have done some long term. Well, your work involves some long term measurements uh, of the air constituents, and you started demonstrating that the O2 content is decreasing due to fossil fuels, as you mentioned. Um, and I think this was a program that you've been leading since about 19, well, the late 1980s, 1989, around there. And then additionally, in around 2005, I believe you started directing the program at Scripps of CO2 program. Um, so after taking this data and you, you've done all of this research, can you speak on your experience in using that research to effectively communicate to the broader public? And what role does that play in influencing environmental policies? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're you're raising a question about how does how does someone like me decide where to put your time? Uh, because this is a big problem and requires lots of contributions in lots of different ways. And I've I've chosen in my own career tra tra trajectory, as my father did, to stay with the production of the basic data and let the data do the speaking, um, because that's in a way the uh, the, the most powerful thing about the CO2 buildup record, now sometimes called the Keeling curve, mm -hmm. um, is that it's often the entry point for people to look at this problem and say, wow, something is big is happening. This is a real problem. And my father already had that message through his data in the 1960s. So that curve was seen by Al Gore. It was seen by President Johnson, probably. So. It, it motivated a lot of people in the, already in the 60s and 70s to take this problem seriously and start working on it. And it still has that power to bring people around to saying, oh, yeah, well, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. But this is something that's hard to be in denial of. The basic fact that we're burning fossil fuel is building up in the atmosphere in such a massive way. It's hard to deny that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so... It, 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 it's important to keep that message in front of people. So I, I viewed that as yeah. my primary role in, in my father's legacy and building other aspects of it. Mm -hmm. okay. so, as a follow-up, what are some of the um, highlights from your work with tracking oxygen? Because, I mean, until I heard you talk about it today, that's something that never really entered into my mind about about that. So what are some of the highlights that you could tell us 
about the tracking that comes from tracking oxygen? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have slides on that from another talk, so I okay. wish I could give it a different talk here. But, uh, <laughs> but okay, so the one of the big differences between oxygen and carbon dioxide is the amount. Carbon dioxide is present at now 400 some parts per million, but that's still parts per million. So right. it's, it's still not a major component of the atmosphere, whereas oxygen is 21% of the atmosphere. There's right. massive amounts of it. We are living in this massive reservoir of oxygen in the atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, that built up over geologic time. And uh, the when we burn fossil fuels, say, uh, we're, 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 emitting more or less the same amount of carbon dioxide as we're consuming in oxygen. So it's sort of the same number of molecules, a little more. You, you, you consume a little more oxygen, maybe 50% more oxygen is consumed when you burn fossil fuels than the amount of carbon dioxide you emit. Mm -hmm. But the relative change in the atmosphere is much smaller for oxygen because it's a massive reservoir. Right. And so as a consequence, even though you say, oh my God, how am I gonna breathe? We're using up oxygen in the air. It's not, and 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 I get I get queries about this with some regularity. Um, I've taken the the position that let's let's focus on the real problem here. We, mm -hmm. we I could make a similar diagram with the reservoir amounts, and you could see that after we burn all of the big reserves of fossil fuel, we still will only have reduced like a, a percent or so of the oxygen level in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. okay. So it doesn't add up to an environmental problem. If, okay. if, if we wanted to be as diabolical as we could <laughs> and burn all the fossil fuel right away, we still wouldn't have an oxygen problem. We'd have oh, a okay. massive car, a climate problem. All right. All right. That sounds good. So, so uh -huh, I well, do have one more question um, on that note for you, actually. Uh, so no, I just want to give you some context as to why I'm asking this question. It, it has to do with your research on the impact on atmospheric oxygen as well as the urban atmospheric greenhouse gas measurements that you did. Uh, have you seen any changes recently with all of the work that all of the countries have been doing in climate change and trying to mitigate climate change? Or has that continued to be on an upward curve all the time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had a paper come out uh, last year uh, led by a postdoc of mine that really tried to pick apart the last, last few years of the record and it, or, or, and really over the whole record to see if we could establish much more precisely the relationship between the growth and the fossil fuel emissions. And what that paper showed was that we could effectively verify the reported fossil fuel emissions pretty well from, from the atmospheric record. Um, and so there's a kind of consistency there. And what the if you if you look at the tabulated emissions of fossil fuel, you'll see that although they're higher than they've ever been, the rates have not increased that much in the last five years or so. So uh, you can say that we're, we, I, I'm not sure I can can have a crystal ball to know where it's going forward. But it's true that um, the emission rates haven't haven't increased much and we can con confirm that with from an atmospheric perspective. Um, that doesn't mean the problem's going away because we're still emitting as much as ever. And that means we're making the problem worse faster than ever because we're at the highest levels of emissions. So there's no good message in that. So I think the, I think we have the capacity to show that we are really making a difference when we start to do it. And it's possible that if it hadn't been for renewables, CO2 fossil fuel emissions would have gone up even more. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we haven't turned any major corner yet. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. That's exactly. the sad truth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we open it up for questions, I do have one more um, slightly personal question for you, if you are open to answering it. So uh, you, and you spoke about the Keeling curve. Um, now, for everyone to reference, that's the curve that uh, was showing the atmospheric changes um, that, he, that Professor Keeling had been shown before. And this was initiated by your dad, Charles Keeling. Um, how has it been for you furthering your dad's work and what has it meant to you to sort of carry on that legacy? Well, I sort of found myself there, you know, it's and, and kind of the same way my father, let's, let's go back to his career. He started measuring carbon dioxide in the, in the 1950s and by the 60s, he already had this curve and his peers said, well, why don't you do something else? I mean, he was a geochemist and geochemists discover different things about the chemistry. He discovered that CO2 was building up in the atmosphere. 
um, as colleagues would say, I mean, he, by the way, he went by Dave. So he went by, it was very confusing. <laughs> Charles, <laughs> David, Keeling, but his, he, he went by Dave. So they, Dave, why don't you do something else? You know, a good geochemist, you're just, you, you don't have any, you're just, you're just doing the same old boring science. Why don't you do something new? And of course, he, what he realized uh, was that it was different. He wasn't just trying to discover some new, new aspect of the earth. He was tracking a planetary crisis that was unfolding. So it had a different kind of implication. He was really in a new field. He was in the field of studying global change. He wasn't, so am I a geochemist? Yes, but I'm also a, a climate change scientist. And he was, he was basically the first person to dedicate his career to solving this problem. I was inspired to measure oxygen because I saw it as a fun analytical challenge early in my career. It was, they're, not, they're very tough measurements. All this oxygen around this makes the measurement very hard. And I, that appealed to me. Let's, let's go after some big problem here and see if we can tackle it with a new gadget. So I built a new gadget and it worked and I tracked changes over time. But then I find myself in the same position my father is in. You know, now that I've shown that oxygen is decreasing, should I just quit and move on? No. I mean, there's sort of incumbent on me to take care of it. So it's it's a little bit like the Dutch boy with the finger in the dike. You know, you, once you put your finger there, you can't pull it out because it has consequences. So both my father and I got pegged, you could say, <laughs> in, this, in this public service of taking care of these long-term records. So that's kind of how it worked. And it, but, it, you know, it's been a fun voyage. And, it, and, and it's a voyage also, it's also a voyage of discovery, sadly, because we're discovering how we're changing the world in real time. Mm -hmm. All right. So are there other questions, other comments from other persons on online now? Pat, Marlene, Katrina, I don't want to... No, Pat here. I'm just trying to kind of get my head around this. Okay, so we have uh, approximately 20% oxygen. We mm -hmm. have very, we have approximately 0 0.04% um, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Yes. And the balance of it is mainly nitrogen. Mm hmm. Seven, so, 78% or something like that. Correct. No, seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's about 70%. Yeah. But so, Solar energy gives uh, has one issue with, with one issue. Now they're predicting the use of hydrogen as an energy source, and of course they're doing it by um from water by electrolysis of water. So how about that one? <laughs> well, because we, know, what we've got to do is to find another source of energy because. We can't go backwards with the energy. The fossil. No, no we, I mean, we, we've got to, with the energy use, we've got accustomed to a certain level of energy use for our way of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so everything that we can do will have a minuscule effect on, on the problem. No, it's a hard problem. I mean, just... We can't, we can't plant... We can't, what you said quite categorically is that um, we can't plant enough plants. Please, yeah. That, <laughs> you said, quote, that's delusional, <laughs> I mean, hmm? which I thought was uh, a good term. Hmm. So, right, just as, as I say, food for thought. Now I'm looking at alternatives, serious alternatives. Thank you very much. You have a good sense of humor. <laughs> not, sure. <laughs> not sure i deserve that but uh, <laughs> I, I try I, I i try to keep a a, 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 light, a light touch as we move along here but yes. uh, yeah, a, couple, a couple comments um on hydrogen hydrogen the way i think about hydrogen is that it's 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 a little bit like electricity and a battery i mean it's it's a conduit but not a source it's not like we're mining hydrogen and burning it, we're converting some other energy into hydrogen and using that as a way to move energy around. Mm -hmm. And it has advantages and disadvantages compared to other ways of doing that. So it's 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 important to develop, but it, it's important also to remember that it's not a primary energy source. It's mm -hmm. just a it's just a, a, a means of moving energy and storing energy. No, um, I agree totally. 
Um, and as for, it, are we accustomed to this level of energy use? Yeah, I, you know, people are not gonna just sacrifice their quality of life for this problem in any big way. Um, but I think people can discover other ways of living that are just as rewarding. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the way, the way people take vacations and the way they, you know, choose to use their discretionary wealth to, to derive satisfaction, those are things that can change. We can change infrastructure that allows people to use a lot less energy to move around. We don't, I mean, there's enormous inefficiencies in how we, 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 we transport things and how we behave. And, and just the fact that we can have this meeting by Zoom means mm. that we didn't have to fly all to one room. There's a lot, <laughs> exactly. there's a lot more low hanging fruit like that. That's mm. not going to, none of these things are going to add up to the whole solution. Um, and, you know, are, are we going to solve this problem? I think that's another question. I mean, to some extent, we just have to tough it out, but the, it's clear that if we we have a we still have a lot of control over the trajectory of that that last third of the fossil fuel pie that I showed there, that's still a long way off uh, before we get to it, probably decades off. So um, we have a lot of control of how this turns out. Mm -hmm. So what? Is, what? Oh, Emma, Emma, go ahead. Yes, I was going to say one of the things that we have tried to be. Uh, earth friendly is we've been uh, composting uh, for our garden and uh, we're trying to get uh, the city to more or less with the disposing of their leaves and things in the fall of the year to find ways of uh, more or less practice uh, uh, friendly methods of uh, keeping uh, everything friendly to the earth. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that helps any at all? Every every little bit helps um, to the extent that you know you're you're able to. I mean, the the biggest issue is is, is fossil fuel burning, and does that directly affect fossil fuel burning? Maybe a little bit <clears throat> because uh, you know fertilizers and other things don't have to be produced. So you're. I mean, there's another there's another sort of planetary uh, perturbation going on involving nitrogen. So the nitrogen cycle is messed up, less like the carbon cycle. So you're also intervening there when you when you compost in probably a good way. You're requiring less fertilizer. Um, and uh, I guess the other reason composting, I, I didn't talk about this. Is, uh, this is actually the most important part of the answer. So um, uh, when you put trash in a landfill and your food waste goes into the landfill, um, it decomposes some of it anaerobically, which produces methane, which is the second most important greenhouse gas on the list. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get your food waste out of the landfill, um, you, you reduce the methane emissions. So a lot of cities are doing that. We, we're starting to do that here in San Diego. So we throw our food waste in the green bin, and then the green bin is composted. So the food waste is decomposed aerobically rather than anaerobically, and therefore it doesn't produce methane. And you also produce fertilizer as a result. Mm -hmm. So there are steps like that that are certainly positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good, good. Any... Dr. Mari? Yes, go ahead. I don't have a question. I just really have a statement. It's that, you know, I'm sitting here and quite frankly, I don't know half the things he was talking about. <laughs> but, but it's the truth, you know, because I'm not at that level. My expertise is in other areas. It's... But I want to thank you and thank him. Because he truly inspired me. To I'm sorry. Go he ahead. truly inspired me to want to know more. I mean, he's motivating me. I'm taking notes actually when he's talking to take action steps and knowing more about my environment. This is why this speaker is so important because you know I didn't know it all. I learned so much and just sitting here in this hour time. And now I'll be able to research and find more. And that's what environmental education is about. And for me, being on this show, this series every Friday, this is what it's about. It's about obtaining knowledge. It's about hearing from people who have expertise, skills in areas and to take us to another level. And it just enhances your, your, your model that the environment is personal because he showed how personal it is for all of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, listen, thank, thank you. If, if I motivated you, you just motivated me. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the feedback loop. That's right. 
So one of the things that in talking about learning um, was the insight you gave that connected global warming to flooding. And I didn't really make that full connection. So am I right in saying, okay, you heat up the planet, it's going to increase evaporation of the waters in the planet, rivers, lakes, ocean, that increases precipitation, rain, and excessive heat, excessive evaporation would lead to excessive rain and consequently flooding. Is that the loop? <laughs> Is that the... Yeah, you said it well, exactly. Okay. I... A, A, A plus, A plus. <laughs> okay, because I mean, that... I, it makes sense, but I never really made that connection until you you talked about it, uh, that entire connection. Yeah, I mean, this isn't my area of work, but <clears throat> but the, the the basics are simple, and this is yes. just what you said. Right. A warmer atmosphere can store more water, which means it can evaporate, drive more evaporation, and it also can provide rain, more rain for precipitation. And we are accelerating the hydrological cycle. So the, the pace at which this is going on is, is faster. And there are also other consequences that get into the details of the meteorology, like the fact that hurricanes now can grow much faster. Exactly. Right? So exactly. we've, we've really seen some of these things you say, wait, wait, did that used to happen? You go from a category <laughs> nothing to a category five oh, yes. in, a, in, a, in a short or category four so quickly. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't remember that happening before, right? And then the scientists right. are looking at saying, no, it didn't happen as much before. Right. The droughts, some of the dams, uh, is it in Colorado, for example? The, you, yeah. you know, well, you the, the big one, big one recently is the Panama Canal drying up. Oh, really? I didn't hear about that. Well, I mean, it's not dried up, but the water levels are down because of the low rain and the low rain probably does have to do with uh, partly because we're in an El Nino, but partly because it's aggravated because of these same feedback loops. And so right. They right. can't carry it. They can't carry the cargo load across the Panama Canal right now because the water levels are too low. The, 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 the canal is a lot of the canal is this Lake Gatun and the levels have dropped. And so they can't they can't the, the ships can't oh. be as loaded as, as deep. Yeah, I'll have to check that out online. That yeah, I wasn't aware of that happening. Um, hello. Hello, Richard, you want to say something? I just wanted to say um... Uh, thank you for the education. I think education is really key. Uh, it's uh, easy to, well, it's difficult to comprehend some of these big picture items. But uh, the study that you've done and shared today was very valuable. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed with your your obvious point that planting a tree doesn't make a big difference. But I'd like to motivate everyone that's listening to think that little things do matter we are a lot of people so everybody moving toward the same cause makes a lot of sense uh the comment about green waste we live near a landfill and we smell it occasionally mm -hmm. and that smell is methane which is you know you've clarified and we know is uh environmental en enemy number two uh so all the things are all the ideas, all your information is good. Now we need to apply it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. Great, thanks. Very good. So there, I think we had a seminar in which the speaker was emphasizing the role of the soil, apart from the decomposition of the trees and leaves and stuff, that the role of the soil in capturing CO2 is that something that you could speak on as well? Well, I mean, if you remember the slide, there was more carbon in soil than in, 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 in plants in aggregate. Uh, soil carbon naturally doesn't build up very quickly. So uh, it would probably take some human intervention to, to, to significantly build up soil carbon. But, um, and I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not really the best person to speak on this, but there's a lot of the land surface that's allocated, allocated to agriculture and there are co-benefits to having more organic carbon in soil mm -hmm. for growing 
but that extra carbon in the soil is carbon that wouldn't be in the air. So you, so their their ideas of enhancing soil carbon in agricultural practice, that, uh, and I agree with Richard. You know, it, it, every little bit helps here, and we're not going to solve this problem with one fell swoop. So, um, soil carbon is one thing. Planting trees does help. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that there's not that much capacity. It's the, 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 what, what I, the way I think about this problem is that we really have to reduce our emissions of fossil fuel quite, right. quite, quite drastically. And then we need to do more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so these other uh, uh, actions we can take are part of let's, you know, needing to do more. But in the absence of major cuts in fossil fuel burning, we are not gonna get, we're not gonna change the trajectory that much. Yeah. So the, the big lever arm is fossil fuels. So I know carbon dioxide is increasing, it's accelerating and increasing. Um, but if you were to give a number, like how many tons of carbon dioxide per second? Do you have a number in your head? Oh, boy. Because um, um, I, I heard something like about a thousand tons per second or something. Yeah, that, I'm just doing it in my head. I think it depends on whether you talk tons of CO2 or tons of carbon. But let's see. We're, I, I, let, me, let, me, let me try to do it. So we're emitting about okay. <laughs> 40 billion tons of CO2 a year. So that's four times 10 to the 10. Uh -huh. And there's basically three times 10 to the seven seconds in a year. Okay. So you divide those, you get one point, you get 1,300. 1,300. Second. Per second. I, I did my math right. I think so that's about. Is that, is, that, is that like your, is that your number? That's, well, we had a speaker yesterday who was on the end of taking, doing electrochemistry as a way to utilize carbon dioxide. And of course he gave the backdrop of how much, you know, why this, why this research um, is important. And I recall about a thousand tons per second is what he said. Yeah. Uh, Something around right. that. Yeah. Okay, okay. And, and growing, <laughs> right? And growing. Your reference to the Bible, either um, Adam and Eve and Eden, um, got me also kind of thinking. First of all, it was surprising. I've never heard that metaphor being used, but it's very apt and right on point. Is that it sounds like environmental scientists, geoscientists, the work that you do is sort of like the prophets of old having to tell the truth about just having to tell the truth. Jeremiah and some of those other prophets. It's not always palatable. It's not always, you know, what we want to hear, but it's the truth. And that's sort of something that, you know, I thought about when you, after you made that analogy to the Eden story. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've made this point is that the this is kind of a biblical, right? It's, it's, a, it's a problem on a biblical scale. You have to you have to look to the you know religious texts like the Bible to come up with something that's analogous. Because you right. think of you think of like the, the the story of 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 humanity is mostly one of of of, of turmoil and recovery i mean mm -hmm. think of like gone with the wind you know the civil war and then back to some kind of you have to re rebuild after after mm -hmm. the crisis the, the, at, there's the aftermath of the storm right like, this is a storm that doesn't end yep yeah there's a storm that just keeps coming and we have to learn to live with it so it, it, right. it doesn't it doesn't doesn't fit the normal narrative right it's biblical it's really biblical yes well on that note we want to thank you so very much for some theology from geochemistry <laughs> atmospheric science the whole works thank you so very much and we look forward to more of hearing from uh, you in your in your work and in your passion and thanks for accepting our invitation
Listen, it was my, it's my pleasure. And thank, thank you for being such a, uh, I don't know, you, you set a wonderful tone here. So uh, okay, so thanks. Be... <laughs> thanks. So Christopher, yeah. we want to also thank you. I know Marcy left, but we want to thank everyone who contributed in um, giving their comments and asking questions as well. And we look forward to seeing you guys again next week, Friday. Uh, if it's Friday, it is Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Thank you. You're welcome.